Welcome in. I'm Colette Wheeland alongside Dr. Stephen Camerata. Steve is a best-selling author, child development expert, especially when it comes to how children learn to talk. And Steve is a late talker himself, if you didn't know that. Today, we're going to be talking about something called apraxia. So I think we should start off by explaining what apraxia is. So apraxia is a relatively uncommon severe speech disorder. And um, it does occur, um, and it actually can be associated with um, genetic syndrome. So, for example, um, uh, children with Rett syndrome often have apraxia, not only apraxia of speech, but also limb apraxia. So um, let's start off with kind of a definition. So apraxia is a really interesting condition. It was described over 100 years ago. And the idea is that um, the person has movement problems for gestures or other motor activities where they show evidence that they can do it. And the main, the original kind of distinction was voluntary versus involuntary. So for example, um, one little girl that um, I saw who had rets, I walked in the room and she said, hi, and it was clear as day. And so then I said to her, you know, I talked to her and played with her and stuff. And then I said, oh, say hi. And she gestured with her mouth and she couldn't say hi. So I knew she had the motor ability to say hi, but she couldn't do it under the volitional things. And so if you walk in, you see somebody scratching their head, this is for limb apraxia. And then, so you know they can do this. And then they put their hands down and you say, um, uh, hey, hey, Miss so-and-so, can you scratch your head? They can't do it. And so that's kind of the essence of apraxia as far as what it's been known as traditionally. And it now has taken on kind of a life of its own in the speech world. And a lot of children are getting a diagnosis of apraxia and it's a window into some kind of treatments. And so I think it's important to talk about it. So childhood apraxia of speech, parents might also hear that referred to as CAS. Yes. To break it down. So right. how common is CAS? So um, it depends. Um, it's, so it's fairly rare. It's a, it's, okay. a, it's a subtype of speech disorder. So we define speech disorder as uh, immature or different speech production. Now, if you ever listen to a two-year-old, all two-year-olds have trouble saying their sounds accurately. And they're kind of cute and, you know, I'm, because I love two-year-olds, I love all children. Um, and so um, actually, and there are reasons for that is that uh, the actual uh, motor uh, systems and the anatomy of a two-year-old's mouth is not the same as an adult. So they simply can't make the sounds the same way as an adult. That's just, and that's typical. So in the same way a six-month-old can't walk, you know, a two-year-old can't make speech sounds completely the same way as an adult can. Um, you know, when the, the little six-month-old gets to be a one, one and a half-year-old, then they can walk. and um, they can talk, but they're in the same way they're clumsy walking, they're kind of clumsy speaking too. That's normal. So when we talk about a speech disorder, we're talking about something that's over and above that. So the most common kind of speech disorder is where um, the child is three or four and they're talking like a two-year-old. So their speech is immature. There's lots of different reasons for that. Um, and that's, you know, important to understand that. And that's, you know, something a speech pathologist can help with. We're all well-trained in that. But there's two other kinds of um, more foundational differences in speech, and one is apraxia, and another one is dysarthria. So apraxia is this uh, situation where they can make the speech sounds, but they're inconsistent, or when you do it on demand or you prompt them, they can't do it. And dysarthria is what we see in something like cerebral palsy, where there's a motor condition that's underlying, and it's, it's not this volitional versus involuntary. There's disruptions in the motor gestures, the timing, and so on that's broader. And the two kinds of speech sound different. Um, we published a paper uh, two years ago on Down syndrome, and about 80% of children with Down syndrome have apraxia or dysarthria. So Down syndrome, that speech disorder, is pretty much a, a common feature. But in children who don't have a genetic condition, don't have Down syndrome, it's pretty rare, actually. So is it something that you're born with, or is there something that triggers it? So um, we don't know is the short answer. Um, there are genetic linkages, so there's a few different genes that... Um, uh, people have identified, um, but they're not deterministic in, in the sense that someone might have a, a gene that's related to apraxia, but they may not have apraxia. But we do have a set of genes that are in the literature that, that relate to that. But, you know, it's like a genetic screen won't necessarily pick that up. Can you outgrow it, or is it something that can only be... So um, the way I'm defining apraxia, which um, goes back to the late 1960s, uh, one of my colleagues who i Published us. I'm honored to have just some wonderful colleagues. Um, his name is Terry Wirtz and his colleague Jay Rosenbeck are some of the real giants in the area of aphasia, people that have speech uh, language problems secondary to stroke. 
And one of the things that happens in strokes is apraxia. And they noticed that some of the children they were seeing had the same symptoms. So they published a paper in the early 19, uh, well, one in the 1970s and in the 1980s where they characterized it. And so that's kind of where it started. And then another colleague who, again, I've been blessed to work with, and um, he's the one that was actually a co-author on that Down syndrome paper I mentioned. Um, he actually came up, his name is Laurie Schreiberg, and he's you know one of our best uh, experts on child speech disorder. Um, he published a paper talking about the basic features of apraxia, childhood apraxia of speech, and that's what we use. Okay, so a child with apraxia necessarily hasn't had a stroke that causes it. No, they it. don't, and that's it's why. Just, okay, yeah, there, but there's a correlation no, you see um, in adults. Actually, you know, that's a good question. Um, apraxia of speech doesn't seem secondary to children that have um, you know, had a brain injury or, or, or a traumatic brain injury or things like that. It's really interesting. So um, this is an aside when, so like if, if I had, um, you know, as an adult, a, a senior adult now, um, if I had um, a stroke or something in a certain region of my brain, I, I would, it would really prevent me from talking. It would have a big impact. A child can have that exact same injury, like right after they're born or even in utero or fairly shortly, and they recover really well. So that neuroplasticity is, is remarkable. And so, yeah, it's not that they, I mean, you never wanna assume anything. You wanna have a medical evaluation, but normally the children with apraxia haven't had a stroke or anything like that. It's just that they have the speech features of these adults that have had a stroke. And that's why um, Dr. Wirtz um, and Dr. Rosenbeck made that correspondence. Well, we're talking about adults and children. Um, one of the questions I had was, um, okay, so apraxia of speech impacts some children. Um, but is it something without a stroke that can suddenly impact an adult or is it, you know, kind of help me understand. So is it something no. that you're either going to have as a kid or then you have some medical event? Yeah. That could so I haven't never, no one's ever really asked me that quite that way. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So, um, no, I mean, if, a if, a an adult had, um, apraxia, there's, there's some event that triggered it. Okay. So they might've had, uh, like, um, like, uh, there's a kind of a temporary speech loss that can occur with these transient ischemic events, you know, these little mini strokes that people get, you know, actually one of my colleagues had one of those and he just completely quit talking and actually checked himself in the emergency room, you know, and he was fine, but you know, it was like, oh, you know, gosh, you know, he had this little event that affected his speech center. So no, that would never happen. So in children, it is different and it's, it is a, it's a developmental condition in the sense that we don't have a cause for it. Um, but it's very noticeable and very dramatic. And again, you know, like, in Down syndrome and rats, we really see it. I mean, it's really a very common condition in rats, not only for speech, but also for limb. So with childhood apraxia, can you outgrow it or? No, I okay. mean, okay, so I gotta be careful here. So the word childhood apraxia of speech, like so many of these things, and you know, um, really has become very broad. And so I'm using the criteria that um, Dr. Wirtz and Dr. Um, Rosenbeck promulgated in the 80s and then were updated um, about 15 years ago by Larry Schreiberg. And so there's specific features and markers for that. And those are a severe speech disorder. People don't grow out of that, you okay. know, and that's part of it. So that's something that needs treatment. And I will say it's, it's not common, but it's not unusual either where people with apraxia can never speak clearly. So I have cases where um, basically the, the children, you know, and now adults, have to use a computer device, an augmentative device to speak for them. They've never been able to talk. That's rare, thankfully, but it does happen in apraxia. What are the signs that parents should be looking for for apraxia? So the, the key markers for apraxia, the, the foundational marker is when a child can uh, say a word or a, a sound clearly, a speech sound clearly in some situations and in other situations they can't. And so um, like um, a little girl we saw recently who has apraxia, um, she said, um, let's go like perfectly clearly. And most of the time when she's speaking, she's completely unintelligible. And so that's one of the key markers that you have where they say this, this phrase or these words really, really clearly. Um, a little bit more of a controversial um, marker, and I don't really use this, but I can understand it and, and see why it's fine to use it is sometimes children will use speech sounds and they're babbling and they don't use them in words. And so that shows that they can make it in babbling. I tend to try to use it more connected to words, but fair enough. So if they can make, for example, SH sounds, R sounds, L sounds when they're babbling, and then they have trouble with words like, you know, show and roll and things like that, could be a sign of apraxia. But it's just, it, I mean, these kids are very hard to understand. They're very unintelligible when you listen to them. 
I had read that um, sometimes kids put the the stress on the wrong syllable. So another marker is what okay. we call prosody or supersegmentals. And so, yeah, that's another thing about uh, praxia is that um, instead of saying um, above, they'll say above, you know, they'll, I'm just using kind of a, a silly sure. example, but the idea is um, they'll use the wrong stress pattern. So disruptions in prosody, um, they may use extreme prosody. So like when you ask a question, you might say, you know, where are you going? And you have a little bit of a rising and they'll go, where are you going? You know, like that. It'll just be a really noticeable difference in that intonation or prosody. Children with apraxia, do you see them just struggling with apraxia at times? Or are there other things that are connected and you always see? So um, it, it is, you know, what you might call pure condition in the sense that there are children who only have apraxia. Okay. But normally it goes along with, a, if you think about it, it's a pretty severe disruption in in kind of motor programming, motor planning. That's kind of how we think of it. And, you know, normally that's going to have spillovers into other domains. So usually it comes along with other things, but it certainly can occur all by itself. So they might struggle with reading, writing, spelling. Yes, yes, they might. And actually, you know, um, other, uh, really another thing is other motor development. Is, is the praxia often uh, misdiagnosed or, or it, it you know, people think it's something yeah. else? Yeah, so one of the, one of the things that I, I try to help parents understand and, and clinicians understand too is oftentimes an apraxia diagnosis will be an entree into doing um, kind of non-evidence-based treatments like they might massage the face they might move the lips they might have them blow bubbles they might have them blowing whistles things like that and those things aren't really helpful so it's like okay your child has apraxia and it, it sounds serious and it is serious um, but maybe the child doesn't does or doesn't have it but then they they'll they'll use that uh, that diagnosis in order to deliver a certain kind of treatment that really the children shouldn't be undergoing. And that's really the main thing I worry about with a false diagnosis, the other, or a uh, misdiagnosis. The other, the other thing um, is that at its core, children with apraxia have trouble, especially when you're prompting them to talk. Like I mentioned the little girl where she could talk just incidentally or involuntarily. But then when I was saying, you know, say hi, say bye and so on, she completely broke down. And so it's interesting to me that a lot of, treatments that are uh, pushed for apraxia actually rely on prompting and imitation. And it's actually kind of the worst modality for these children. And so we published some work and, um, you know, you can go to latetalker.org um, website and get these chapters and these articles. But basically um, when you're working with apraxia, um, kind of a standard of doing it is where you do this conversationally based, it's called lexically based recast, where you take the words and you say it back to them and you, you kind of help them to learn how to say the words with less stress under prompting, you know, less, less emotional stress, not less intonational stress. Um, and that's really a good approach for, for apraxia. Um, things where you're basically telling the child to do tongue exercises, doing things on demand. If you think about it, that doesn't really match up with the profile. So um, I have a colleague named Edie Strand who's published some really good work on apraxia. Um, you know, some some of it I wouldn't agree with, but but most of it I think she's very very good. And so you might want to access Edie Strand's work as well. That's such great information because in, in so many times we hear like prompting's good for certain speech disorders, others absolutely not. Sure. So prompting should be in our toolkit. So one of the normal. I mean, uh, one of a very common, what we call residual developmental errors, a lot of children have trouble with R's and L's and a lot of children have trouble with S's and, you know, we might have lisps and we might have W for R, you know, and you think about a wascally wabbit, you know, Mel Blanc was so good at imitating some of these things. Maybe today wouldn't be appropriate, but back then, you know, he was imitating speech disorders. Um, and so, you know, we, we know how to do that. And when a child gets to be school age, and they're motivated, teaching them how to make the sounds is really effective and every speech pass should know how to do that. So it's definitely in our toolkit. Um, but, you know, with preschoolers and toddlers, you know, um, a lot of them are prompt resistant, so we wouldn't want to do that. Um, there's another uh, approach where um, it actually is called prompt, that's the name of it, capital, um, capital letters. And um, the person who develops a motor speech person, and she's absolutely correct in saying that if you, for example, stick your hands in the child's mouth or you stick um, you know, some kind of a, like a, a um, like what's called a speech buddy. Uh, she doesn't do speech buddy, but it's the idea of putting some kind of a plastic appliance in the child's mouth so that, for example, you can lift their tongue. They can make the sound. And that's true. But once you take your hands out of the appliance out, then they, they can. can. So the general, we call that generalization. And so 
Um, we just really want to limit our use of prompting to when it's going to be most effective. Should a parent seek a neurologist for help? I mean, Always. That, okay. <laughs> yeah. So if a child has a praxis of speech, there it certainly is secondary to neurological conditions and. Um, you definitely, I mean, you, all eight talkers, you want to go to your physician and rule out any health conditions, always want to make sure they have a hearing test, always. But once you've passed those hurdles and you've screened those, then you definitely want to go and see if there's something neurologic, because this is a significant motor challenge. Well, now, again, they won't necessarily, it may not necessarily show something, but you definitely don't want to assume there may be a neurological condition there that you have to deal with above and beyond the speech disorder. Well, at what point should parents be seeking medical attention? Um, so basically, if, if for all late talking children, when you go in for your 18 month or, or two year old visit and the child's not talking, you want to have that conversation with your pediatrician to see or your family doc, family physician to see if they should be referred for additional evaluations, medical evaluations that, you know, are things like neurology or, or whatever it is that physician in, thinks is indicated based on what, what they're seeing in the child. You do that right away. What's the, what's the best advice for parents in this position? How can they help their child with apraxia? You know what's really cool? Um, that um, one very effective evidence-based treatment, and, and uh, Mary and I are part of the, a group of people that actually developed this treatment. My colleague Paul Yoder was also involved in it here at Vanderbilt. Um, and the idea is that um, basically when the child um, touches a toy or they, um, they try to talk, guess what the word is and just say that one word back to them. You know, I call it the mockingbird game. It's called a Lexley based recast, which is a technical name for saying the way children learn is that when they, and this is true for the little two year olds, right? They touch something, they look at the parent and the parent says the word and they have a lot of internal circuits that, that map those sounds. In fact, it's really kind of cool. Um, there's a, uh, a colleague, um, uh, a, a, Basically, an animal researcher has seen that marmosets do this and other primates. So the little baby marmoset whistle. They have like insect calls. It's kind of cool. They whistle, and then the mommy says it back to them. And it's really interesting because there's these basic circuits where the baby says something. It triggers a response in the mo mother, and somehow the baby and the mother kind of know how to align those abilities, and it helps facilitate the marmoset speech development. And we think that's happening in, in humans as well can't prove it directly like we can in marmosets, but it's the same process. So the example I like to use is when a little child, a little toddler comes up to the fridge and says, it's a two-year-old. They say, why do you don't know what they're saying? They have a meltdown. <laughs> so then you start playing 20 questions and you figure out that they are <laughs> wanting juice, you know? And so what do you do as a parent? You say, oh, want juice, want juice. You want juice, and that's that's the magic that that will drive speech development. And so you can do that with a praxis, and it, and, it, and it's effective. Um, the reality, though, is that you know classic apraxia, full description, that speech development is going to be really slow, and it's just going to be a real journey, and it's really hard. And I do recommend we think about um, you know some kind of a um, a writing system, or when the child gets a little older, some kind of a an augmentative system as a bridge to communication. Because as a child gets older and they can't understand you, it can be really frustrating. So we do recommend that for, for children that have kind of the severe apraxia. We're going to get more into the interventions of apraxia. We're going to talk about that next week. So be sure to check back in for that right here. Uh, in the meantime, give us your questions. Put them in the comment section below. Click subscribe so we can get this valuable information your way. Hit that bell. And of course, you can always check out the Late Talkers Foundation website. And remember, the best thing for your child is you. <laughs>